Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edisat Live Lectures. Dear friends, as you know that we have started a series on uh, religion, society and culture in, in Indian history. Today we are conducting yet another lecture in the same series. In today's lecture we will try and understand architecture in uh, Sultanate era and after that we will be discussing architecture in Mughal era as well. To discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert Dr. Nimal Kumar. Dr. Kumar is Associate Professor in the Department of History in Sri Venkateshwara College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome sir. Thank you. Um, this uh, particular lecture today, we are talking about uh, in terms of religion, society and culture in Indian history in that series. And uh, as a backgrounder to whatever we have, we also have to understand what is culture. Now when we talk of the culture of, say in this lecture we are talking about from 1200 to uh, say for example 1550, when we talk about this particular period, we talk about uh, the dominant theme is Islam and it, with Islam came Islamic polity, Islamic state, Islamic administration and with that came their concept of uh, uh, culture. Now when we, I use word culture it, has, it is a very value-loaded word, which uh, it means some kind of domination or hegemony through music, through dance, through food, through house, through living, of course through architecture and painting. We create a, a very complex web of, a very, very complex web of culture which helps govern better, govern fuller. It creates a class of governed and governs. So in that sense we are talking about and today we will be talking about architecture of Delhi Sultanate. As many of you know that Delhi Sultanate means uh, when 1192 after the invasion of uh, uh, Delhi and uh, it was by Muhammad of Ghor that they won, they established the Delhi Sultanate in Lahore and then uh, in 1200 and post 1200 El Tutmish where the ruler shifted to Delhi. So that period we are talking about and what are the architectural styles you have. So that is what the background whole will be talking about uh, in this particular lecture. Uh, see this, Islamic polity uh, had reached Indian territories with the Turkish invasion of 1192, where the Turkish forces under uh, Muhammad of Ghor defeated the North Indian regional power of Pitsvira Chahan. Now, um, there may be a lot of stories about it, but many of them are not supported historically. Uh, traveling that entire Middle East, Islam evolved a cultural, complex and architectural traditions. You know, they borrowed from everywhere, wherever they went. They went to Turkey, they went to uh, Spain, they went to uh, Ethiopia, they went to Sudan. From everywhere, they picked up certain aspects of architecture and culture and then amalgamated them together. By the time they reached in 13th century, or late 20th and late 12th and uh, early 13th century, what we find is that we find that the culture which had come in a very amalgamated, very kind of uh, evolved form. The different topographical conditions and cultural experiences, it was able to develop a fusion of architectural styles which can no longer be called purely Islamic or given any specific regional name. Now, in North India specifically, except extreme East and extreme West, we do not have much of architecture. Also because for a very long period we didn't have an empire system, also because we didn't have enough stones and the people who could build them. You know, temples are not built by only by architects or only by masons. They are to be built by the money. A lot of money goes into it. A lot of empire building goes into it. If you had temples in south, it always meant that you had, uh, you know, um, if you had temples, you also had huge empire funding that temple activity. It's not possible without that. And in North India, you find that post Maria and post Gupta, you don't have, except for a brief period of Harsha, you don't have much of uh, state, uh, much of empire, and that is why you don't have uh, architecture as well. Now, uh, why Islam had concrete architecture? The question which comes to our mind that, you know, why suddenly with the coming of Islam, we have concrete architecture? The reason being it, Islam in itself is a very urban religion. It requires 
that wherever there are 14 Mumin, Mumin means Muslims, believers, wherever there are 40 Muslim, you should have a mosque. Wherever you have 40 Muslim, you should have uh, prayers. And um, a Muslim is supposed to offer prayer five times a day. At least once in a week on Friday, they should say together. This prayer should be said, the namaz should be offered together. That means they needed a, 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 a mosque. This is the kind of community. And then again, concept of community is ummah. That the Islam and Muslim communities will decide all the matters in consultation with each other. So that required certain communal building. When I say communal, I mean of community, not of uh, any other term that in India we understand Hindu, Muslim, Christian, but community. You need community buildings. You have community hall where you have marriages. You have community hall where you meet for other activities. And similarly, uh, mosque would play the role. Now, uh, it's very, very important that these ceremonial buildings often made of stones, also because in a desert land, you have to have some kind of protection from desert wind and all. Uh, these ceremonial buildings often made of stones were also to serve as social anchor and resting places for traveling and trading caravans. So that is what is important, you know, why, why architecture would be there in Islam and why architecture would not be there in any other religion. I mean, it's not so important. Uh, of course, in Europe also we had for the same reason that it was very cold. Now, what are the main features of Islamic architecture? When I say Islamic architecture, I don't mean Hindu and Muslim. For me, Islam is a culture. When I say Islamic, I mean the entire land, entire land mass. From Iraq to Iran, to Sudan, to Ethiopia, to Indonesia, it's a huge land mass we talk, and probably a part of Europe also, a huge land mass we talk, where Islam traveled and got something or the other from them in order to what is called is Islamic architecture and that is what that is how I mean it through expansion in the Middle East and the Russian territories and even Europe Islam evolved with certain architectural principles and styles incorporating local features the main features what we'll be discussing this and again in the next uh, lecture also main features of Islamic architecture are minarets that is minar domes that is called gumbad in Hindi archer that is called mehrab in Hindi and the lack of pillar and beams which are hallmark of Hindu architecture. You don't have the pillars, you don't have the beam. And that is why what you have is uh, basically minarets, minar, domes, gumbad, around, it could be a bulbous, it could be as bulbous as possible, it could be the shape of onion, it could be the shape of garlic, depending upon which region it came from, and the arches. I'll explain the arches, why arches, two arches are required. Uh, they are required to take the load of the dome because the, the building does not have either pillar or uh, beams. Now, why don't they have pillar and beam? Also because in Islam, it was required to offer prayer. And in prayer, the namazis are supposed to stand in straight line. And if there are pillars in the building, inside the building, then a straight line would not be formed. And the namazis would not be able to see the imam and see the person who is leading the prayer. That is why there is a, there is a you know, a kind of... Uh, uh, no, no pillar, no band, no pillar, no beams in Islamic architecture. Now, as soon as the Turks landed in India and settled, they did in mosques. But obviously, there were there was an army, and there were more than forty Muslims. There were more than forty Muslims, and that is why they needed a mosque to pray. And when they shifted to Delhi. They found a place where a lot of construction was going on. This is the Kutubinar area or Mahroli or Lalkot area, what you call. And they found that a Vishnu temple was being uh, constructed uh, by, by, the, by the representatives of Prince Viraj Chauhan. They demolished that and used all the material for making a mosque which is known as Kovat ul Islam, the glory of Islam. And this is called rubble architecture. It happens everywhere. It is nothing against Hindu and Muslim. It is nothing against rivalry. It is just that you needed building material and you got building material in the shape of existing building. And what you did is you demolished the building and make a new one. You use the rubble. It's called, that's why it's called rubble. Rubble architecture. Rubble as to make the new building. That's how it is. So you have Kuwatul Islam, the glory of Islam. And this particular area where you, whenever you go to Qutub Minar, please notice, you would find a colonnaded arcade in and around Qutub uh, Mahroli iron pillar. There is an iron pillar, famous iron pillar. Um, and um, 
uh, some of you must have seen it either in a picture or some of the films, uh, if I remind you of uh, one of the films with Chini Kambe, Amitabh Bachchan goes and hucks that pillar. I mean, that's the pillar I'm talking about, the ancient pillar which are there. In and around you have a colonnaded arcade. That is what is known as Kuwatul Islam. Now, the importance of this is mosque in Islam is really huge. In a way that Islam considers this particular mosque to be one of the mosques of pride because in a largely non-believer land, non-Muslim land, they could construct the first mosque and that is the respect in Islamic land of this particular area. Now, Qutub complex, uh, it is named after Qutub um, uh, Binar. Uh, it's the first building complex for the Muslim rulers in India where a mosque was constructed around the existing Mehrani iron pillar. This iron pillar was made by the Guptas. Uh, it's still not rusted and it's a question of a lot of people talk about it, why it has not rusted for thousands of years. The mosque has a pillared enclave and a very basic dome, which we also call it ugly dome. They are funnel kind of domes, which are very ugly and that domes are there because they couldn't, they did not know the art of making dome. They didn't make the art of uh, making the uh, gumbad, what we call gumbad. They didn't know how to make. So what they did is they, they filled the rubble, whatever the uh, stone and whatever they had and plaster the outer side to get a uh, size of a dome, which was not a very good one. We can see there even now, it was expanded thrice in order to accommodate the rising number of Muslims in Delhi. Similar act can be seen in Ajmer, where you have Khaza Maruddin Chishti's Dargha, which is known as Adhai Din Ka Jhopra, obviously suggesting that this particular masjid or mosque was made hurriedly because army was there and army needed to uh, pray and that is why in two and a half days, whatever the temple was, they broke that and Ajmer has a lot of, uh, including Brahma, very near in Pushkar, it has a lot of tem Hindu temples. Uh, they broke that and made a um, masjid called Adhai Din Ka Jhopra. Very similar in style in architecture. If you go to uh, Kovatul Islam Mosque, you will find till the pillars and everything, you would find it looks like a temple. But that is what it is be. And whatever the figurines you have, they were chopped up. The face was chopped up in order to make, because Islam did not allow showing any figure, any human figure, any living thing. This is what it is, roughly. Um, and uh, you can see, you can see what I am talking about is the first. On the, on the below side, you can see a uh, mosque colonnaded arcade with a basic basic flat roof and then you can see domes on that which is a very very simple conical dome. It shows that they did not know how to make a dome and then you can see people gathered around where they were, uh, there is a pillar. I will talk about the other monuments later but what about it is it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a semi, semi, semi square uh, structure where they could uh, come and pray. Now the only requirement for a uh, mosque was that on the west on the west side people should wear the namazis should face the west and rest all the fortifications rest all whatever happened in a namaz uh, in a in a masjid is later on if you have money you go for a bigger thing that's all otherwise the requirement is that on the west side some kind of a shamiana or kanat or maybe a tent may be erected or maybe a wall so that the namazis are not disturbed this is what we get now, you can see very well in this that it was a very, very simple structure. Even though in value it is huge, it is just next to the Qutub Minar. This is what we are talking about. This, is the, this is, phase is called rubble architecture. Now, in Qutub complex, <coughs> the most spectacular building is the first, the famous Qutub Minar. But this was incidentally not named after its builder. Its builder was, uh, uh, you know, uh, Qutubuddin Abba the ruler who ruled when he shifted to India, uh, to, to Delhi. He was the general of Muhammad of Ghor. But it was named after a famous Sufi saint who is buried right across Sheikh Qutbuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki. Kaki means roti. He was very famous that, you know, whenever you go to him and you meet him, his hands, from his hands, rotis start flowing in. Probably he gave a lot of donation. It's a sort of a victory tower to commemorate the Turkish victory of 1192. There was a tradition done in Rajasthan also, in Gujarat also, and the whole of Middle East, what you call Central Asia. It's built in red sandstone with 
lot of calligraphy. Calligraphy is very artistic writing of Arabic script. So you have that because other forms of de depiction, other forms of beautification of a monument is banned in Islam. So the only way you could do that is to do calligraphy. It is 71.4 meter tall and it has four story. At one time it was bigger than Empire State Building. It's a huge monument. Just think of it, thousand years from now, how the people must have taken those uh, you know, I mean, stones which are more than one ton and two and a half tons, so high and built it. It has lasted for 2,000 years, almost 1,000 years. Upper part of that was, was harmed sometimes in lightning, but that was repaired and you can't make out. It's a beautiful structure. It's fatter at the base and it tapers and becomes slimmer towards the top, toward the end, toward the top. You can actually access it through a stair inside, but after a very, very heinous, uh, a very, uh, very uh, bad accident where the many children had died because of a stampede, the, you can't now access it from the uh, stair. Now, minars are supposed to be where the muazzin will stand normally. It is attached. This minar is incidentally supposed to be the minar of muazzin minar of uh, the uh, Kowatul Islam Mosque, but it is you know, many, many times more uh, taller than the um, Kuwaitul Islam Mosque itself. Um, Muazzin is supposed to climb and give call for the prayer for uh, that this is the time when all the moments come and pray, remember your God. So it is supposed to be like that. Now, other prominent building here, we see the evolution, the tomb of il one of the very important ruler of Delhi Sultanate, father of Raja Sultan as well, who established Delhi Sultanate, who started his own coin, and many other things he took, he is buried right on the corner. His building, the roof is missing. Uh, just four walls are there and from the top, from bottom to the top, you have calligraphy in the inside, inside wall. Uh, you have a grave, but various other things are missing, also because grave dealers might have take, taken them away. But the reason why you don't have a roof or a dome here is that the, what was the style was, the dome was made on the roof, it is a roof and dome was kept right on top and it was a heavy rubble structure, a lot of filling was there and it was too heavy for uh, the, uh, the, the roof to take and that is why it would collapse. So till we come to Balban, Balban became in, Balban came in 1258, till we go there, till middle of the 13th century you find even Balban tomb doesn't have a roof. Also because they were not able to manage an architecture where the dome or the architecture would survive. Now, you see here, there is a screen of arches. Just screen is there. The arches were there. They were built by Alauddin Khaji. Alauddin Khaji became the ruler in 1296. The whole idea behind this particular screen of arches there is, people say that you used to hang, you used to hang curtains from there so that Namazi would not be disturbed. But that might not have been the original purpose. The original purpose for the screen is to showcase that look, now we are able to build these what is called Islamic or true arches. That's the whole idea. The whole idea was to show off that see we can build. Now, I mean, look at the India Gate. Look at the Gateway of India, Bombay. Look at the Victoria's Canopy in Delhi where you go to India Gate, you find. I mean, the whole purpose is to impress upon the people that look, we can build such a massive thing. And it had no purpose, no one was living there. Why, 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 you, why you have such a huge Viceroy Lodge known as Rashpati Bhavan? Because architecture impresses the people you govern. So it was, screen of arches was basically meant to impress the people of his architectural prowess which architects had gained by now. Now I'll be talking about other monuments of Alauddin period also. By the time we come to Alauddin, we find the dome have survived, arches have come in, roofs have survived. So we'll be talking about that. Now, the next and perhaps the most stylistic building which we find in this complex is a truly exemplary building. It's Alai Darwaza. Alai means Alauddin. So if Alai is there, because Alauddin is there, it becomes Alai. It's Alai Darwaza built by Alauddin Khalji. If you look at this, it's made in red sandstone. It has a dome. It has true arches. It has a little bit of marble also. It has a dome which has survived. It's a double storied building. And it has survived. The beauty of this monument is it's near perfect. 
This used to be the gate from which you entered at that time into the Qutub complex. Right now we enter from the other side. This is not the original gate. That is made by later by Archaeological Survey of India. This was the gate. This is the gateway complex. You have flight of steps. You go into the monument. It has a hollow dome. Why did the dome survive? Because the dome was not filled with rubble any longer. It was not a load on the roof, but it was called hollow dome. It, was, it did not have any rubble inside, one. Second thing is, you can see arches here, many of the arches in the building. You can see many of the arches in the building. And these arches are supposed to, when you have a roof, when you have a roof and then you have a dome, you also have arches here. They take the weight down to the wall where it is stronger. And when they started knowing arches, when they started understanding arches, you find that the roof are intact. That's why this building is so fabulous. Also, it's a show off. You know, everybody, such a respected place and site, this was Kuwaitul Islam Mosque, that everybody till the Mughals you find that they wanted to add something to this. And then another thing is Nizamuddin Aliyah's Dargah. They wanted to build something there because of the historical association of this place with the rise of Islam. Now, it's a double-storied monument, I told you. It's a hollow dome, it's a true arch, it's a bulbous dome. Even though the dome is not very visible, there are problems with dome, there are problems with the height of the monument. But with the hollow dome, the Sultanate architects were able to solve the problem of making the domes lighter. You had to make them lighter so that they could survive. It also showcased the confidence of the architect to have been able to build double-storied buildings and use arches to lessen the world. That's very, very important. You have to make a double-storied building. When you don't have pillars, you don't have beams. So what do you do? Then what do you do is, then you go in for arches. What you call in Hindi, they are called mehrab. And you need them in order to uh, make the roof possible. Now after Khaljis comes Tughlaq. It was Gyatuddin Tughlaq, then Mahabim Tughlaq, and then Firosha Tughlaq. And uh, many, of the, many of the buildings in Delhi, when you roam around, you would find are from Tughlaq period. And um, for most of the buildings, they use grey sandstone, which is Hindi known as Kala Balua Pathar, Balu, sand. And the problem was they struggled with the small structure, smallest teacher of the building, the small height of the building. They could, not, they could not make building taller, that's a problem. And by using grey sandstone, they could not beautify it. They could not add to the monument. We also find more death memorials from Tughlaq times than others, suggesting the uncertainty of life in the times of Tughlaqs in 14th century. A lot of wars. Mahabit Tughlaq had to face large number of revolts and possibly the certainty of life was not there and that is why this fascination for this. Also because of the lack of control. Tombs can be built only of the emperor. Now you find in Tughlaq period and later on Lodi period, even the people of harem, nobles, everyone started building a tomb of their own. Tomb is a resting place. You have a grave where Musalman is buried and then you have a canopy over that, whatever, small, big, whatever. Even Taj Mahal is a tomb. Humayun tomb is a tomb. So, the tomb. So, only emperor could be. Like in Tughlaq period, we find that even everybody, everybody from the royal family, even, even women, even, even officers started getting buried in uh, uh, Tughlaq, I mean, tomb style. So, one of the early buildings of Tughlaq period is the tomb of Ghyasuddin Tughlaq, the first ruler who came and the father of Mahabad Mi Tughlaq. And uh, in Tughlaqabad, when you, when you when you are going from Delhi to Faridabad, you would find on the way, it's a, it's a kind of, you see, you can see in this picture, it's a kind of fortress complex with some kind of grass. There is a tapering building, which is flat at, flat at the bottom and narrow at the top, which has a perfect marble dome with a kalash. And the building is in red sandstone and marble. Many of the features have started. And then you see a wall, enclosing wall. And this enclosing wall has so-called uh, places are there where the sentries, the, uh, the sepoys or the sentry or the guards could stand. Of course, no one would stand. And this building, today it stands separated from Tughlaqabad Fort, but it was not at that time. It was joined by a bridge, which you can see on the right side. You can even now see there's a kind of a bridge. This bridge was broken to make the road, but this bridge is there. And this is a fantastic monument. In fact, uh, when we talk later, of the Mughal period and we talk about more of the monuments, we talk about Humayun tomb, we will talk about this structure that how garden crept in, how the wall crept in, how the red sandstone and marble crept in, Kalash came in and the 
look at the architecture, look at the uh, arches in this, they are true arches, true Islamic arches. It is a very beautiful monument, sadly neglected by Delhi tourism. It is a monument which opens windows to the later Mughal uh, period. Now, this is the detail which we are talking about it. It is a kind of precursor to the Mughal style. Mughal style followed that. Mughal style borrowed almost all. They borrowed the garden. Lodhis also did garden. They borrowed the garden. They borrowed the red sandstone. They borrowed the marble. And they borrowed also the encasing of a monument and then making it a garden complex. Almost everything is a beautiful monument by that. Now, Lodhis came after. And uh, Lodhis were uh, the rulers who again ruled for three generations. Uh, Bahlu Lodi, Sikandar Lodi and Ibrahim Lodi and Ibrahim Lodi was finally defeated by um, uh, Babur in 1526. Lodis were Afghans, they were living in India for some time, very liberal people. Uh, Bahlul was not but later on you find Sikandar and Ibrahim were liberal people but they were not able to control their own people that is a political detail which you must have studied in your other uh, topics. Lodi's preferred octagonal structure, octagonal is where you have eight walls. If you pass by Lodi uh, garden sometimes, you can go and see that you had eight walls. Normally otherwise all other tombs had only four walls, only four walls and it had eight walls, eight structure and also that they started placing these monuments in a garden and that is why you have famous Lodi garden. Now we conclude. Delhi Sultanate architecture was part of the imperial visuality, visual culture to create popular acceptance and brand image. This was necessary for a new alien culture to make people accept and live in awe of the new state and the ruler. Architecture is essential part of medieval state culture complex state dash culture dash complex that is used by the ruling class to disempower the viewer. The people who are viewing, the people who are visiting, they should feel an awe of the state that the, that the role and impose its will. That is the role of architecture. It started with massive Qutub Minar to scare and impress the new rule. It went on to extend into royal palace fortresses and tombs denoting the importance of life and death of the rulers. The growth of Sultanate architecture is really impressive where the patrons with huge disposable income needed to build concrete structure and were inbuilt in the cultural lineage. They built, they built large number of mosques, madarsas, tombs and fortresses to ensure the compliance and acceptance. From square tomb of Il Tutmish to tapering tomb of Ghyasuddin, octagonal ones to Lodi's style had really travelled well. The mosque art too had undergone huge experiment with rubble, Kubatul Islam to Khidki Mosque with many pillars and fortress like engagement. Thank you very much.
are talking uh, in the series of society, religion, and culture in Indian history. And in that series, uh, now I'll be talking about the Mughal architecture. Now, what we saw in Sultanate, I'll give you a very brief outline of what we saw. And through some of the pictures, I'll try to explain what are the basics of Mughal architecture. Now, there are a lot of things which we know. There are thousands of monuments which Mughals made. We are not going to all of them. We are going to basically stylistic changes, stylistic developments which take place in this particular period. When we call Mughal, we call about, we, we talk from 1526 when Babur's invasion in India. And then we go on to, say, for example, uh, till 1800. You can say when the 1857, the last Mughal ruler ruled, but we are not talking till then. We are talking till Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan and the, uh, the construction of Taj Mahal and uh, this particular period. So we come down to around about middle of 17th century. And that is the period when we talk about. Uh, later on, you find, after that, you find Mughal architecture decline. Um, during the centuries of Delhi Sultanate, Islamic, Islamic style of architecture. Again, I must warn that when I say Islamic, I mean cultural. Uh, developed in India and also was able to stabilize the various forms like dome and arches, gumbad and mehrab. All forms of styles had made appearance in the Sultanate times like domes, minaret that is called minar and the true arches called mehrab. From mosque to forts to tombs, tombs where someone is buried, fort is a kila, mosque is a masjid. All types of buildings had emerged and found its shape and content. That's the contribution. Because, you know, Mughals were starting with 100 years of Islamic rule in India. So many of the things, many of the terms, many of the style, they did not have to explain which Sultanate had to in 1200. The DS, that is the Delhi Sultanate architecture, had left a few issues unresolved. You know, they built a lot of things, but a couple of things they could not solve, they could not... They could not do it. I mean, you go to a Delhi Sultanate monument in Delhi and anywhere else in North India and you find that there are problems. The problem is the structures needed high. The structures were short. They were small structures. Through red, though red sandstone and marble had been used, its perfect use was still to become common. The minarets, that is the minar, needed rice placement. Where do you place the minar in the monument? Is it going to be outside the monument? Is it going to be on the monument? Where it is going to be? Minar was small, Minar had to become bigger, Minar had to become independent. The dome, that is the Gumbad, needed to be as bulbous as possible and lighter and gain height for better visibility. What happened that when you when you approach a Sultanate monument and there was a roof line, so Minar was kept here, I mean dome was kept here. So what happened that when, when a viewer approaches, half of the dome you cannot see. That had to be solved. One way the Tughlaqs solved is to placing a monument in a kind of artificial hillock like Lodi Garden. But it also did not allow much gaining of height. There was small one camera, one camera called unicameral, one room structure, four wall structure. And then the gardens were there. We, we saw that in, we'll see that in Kutub complex, I'm uh, sorry, we see that in uh, Gyasuddin Tughlaq tomb. We also see that in Lodi um, uh, thing. But the gardens needed to be expanded in detail. Now, what the Mughal landmarks were, before we begin, Mughals were great builders and built massive buildings that marked the pre-British period of India and the biggest tourist draws today, including the Taj Mahal. They improved the dome, the arches, and completely transformed the minarets. Building on truly Mughal architectural style, they borrowed heavily from various regional architectural styles like Jaunpur, Malwa, Bengal, Rajasthan, Gujarat, they borrowed from all. This is the first Mughal monument they built. Humayun tomb. Humayun ka makbara. Humayun is buried here. You know, but this monument is surprising. It is a perfect monument. The first Mughal monument, which was constructed in 1569, it is a perfect monument. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some detail and I'll come back to this. Is that built by Akbar, Akbar Humayun's son, Babra was the first ruler, then comes Humayun, then comes Akbar. His wife, Humayun's wife, uh, we really do not know who was she, uh, but we get the name that she was the Haji Begum. Uh, and uh, its construction started in 1569. Almost 13 years 
14 years after Humayun died. This is the first major construction and was so perfect in every way, it surprises us. It needs explanation which we will give. It immediately solved the problem of adding height, hiding off the monuments, off the monuments by placing them on 21 feet platform. When you see the monument, you see the platform, you see the monument being set on a platform. It was made in red sandstone. When you add, um, when you add 21 feet platform to any monument, monument will be taller. As simple as that. It was made in red sandstone and liberal use of marbles that were to establish the typical Mughal style. Now, Humayun tomb will give a little bit of detail because you know it is the precursor of all the monuments which Mughals built. The location was chosen because it was close to the Darga of revered Sufi saint Sheikh Nizamuddin Aliya. And you also had a waterfront, like a river was flowing next to it. The whole colony of immigrants, immigrant artisans called, uh, in, art, even today it is called, if you Google it, you will see that it's called Arab Ki Sarai, was set up who worked on the monument and perhaps that explained the flawless design. This is what I was saying is that why the first monument should be so perfect. Also because it was not built by Indians. Indians who were used to making small Indian uh, monuments, in which they were used to making grey sandstone with a black, um, you know, uh, it's a marble and then red sandstone and it's perfect in every manner, says very clearly that immigrant artisans had done that. Similar thing we uh, say about Kutub Minar as well. What are the major features of my tomb? Built in red sandstone and red marble. It was placed on a 21, 21 feet high platform to add to its height. It is enclosed in a square garden called Chahar Bagh. Chahar means four in Persian. Chahar Bagh, a square bagh, which is cut into four again, was further divided into four squares and the main building was placed right in the middle of the four squares. It is supposed to be understood that anyone who is buried there after the death, he will get the similar house in the heaven when he goes and only emperor could ensure that wherever he, whether he is living or dead, he will, he will make his own house. It was surrounded by a ceremonial protection wall all over and with a baradari. Baradari means a kind of a courtyard where you sit and enjoy the river. Uh, it, it had a river. For the first time, attempt was made to bracket the monument. When you have a Humayun tomb, if you go to Humayun tomb, like much like in Taj, you would find on the both side, one side you would find a sarai and other side you will find a, a, a mosque. This was to bracket the monument by inferior monument, inferior material so that your attention is bracketed and you are not able to see everything but when the, both the monuments will bracket and then you are able to see only what uh, uh, you know the architect wanted you to see, in this case the Humayun tomb. The main monument was built in red sandstone and had many rooms with a main chamber. There was one chamber and then many rooms being reserved for the resting place of the Emperor Humayun. You normally the emperor should be buried right 90 degree proportional to the dome. Where there is a gumba, the dome, 90 degree below you should be having the dome. In Humayun tomb, as well as Taj Mahal, as well as in Sikandra, the, all the Mughal monuments, you find the grave which you come. That is not the real grave, this is a fake grave. Real grave would be that in the basement. There would be another grave. This building was made lighter with profuse use of jalis. If you have a concrete wall, wall will be very heavy. What do you do is you use jali, net, cemented net, allow the air to pass and make the walls lighter and lot of arches. The Humayun tomb was also had perfect bulbous dome made of white marble and placed on a circular drum. There was a drum and in that the dome was placed for more visibility. They solved the problem. Look, look how simply they are solving the problem. I mean the Mughal, all the problem of Delhi Sultanate, you find that the Mughals were able to solve with just one monument. That's Humayun tomb. And that is no wonder it is a World Heritage Monument. UNESCO has declared a World Heritage Monument along with uh, Lal Kila and uh, along with uh, uh, Qutub Binar. In Delhi you have three World Heritage Monuments. It's, it's superb. Monument is perfect in every sense. This monument also started the pattern of giving dome the company. On the dome, in the, in the, on the rooftop you find the dome is lonely in most of the Sultanate monuments. But here you find dome has uh, many minars, a small minar called minaret and chhatri is called kiosk, the small kiosk, four pillar and a, uh, and a canopy uh, in order to give company. So the roof line is not boring and loop line is not monotonous. Now the next is Akbar's period. This was also built in Akbar, but Akbar is own um, architecture. 
So the almost the founder of Akbar was almost a founder of the Mughal Empire, and hence his emphasis on utility and strength in his building are visible through. Though he did massive experiments when he came to Fatehpur Sikri and his own tomb at Sikandra. I mean, some of the some of the, some of the uh, experiments would not go well, especially at uh, go down well, especially at tomb of his own tomb at Sikandra. His monument generally built in red sandstone and some use of marble were huge in expanse. They were bigger, they were larger, much like his empire, and generally conveyed the new found strength of the empire. His monuments started using the Star of David, two triangles cut in each other, which even Christians would love to use. Many of my European friends, they come and they were very surprised that a Muslim monarch and as powerful as, uh, you know, Akbar and then Shah Jahan were using uh, what is a Jewish uh, symbol. They used jalis, they used chhatris, he used kanjura, the small domes which you find, even in Red Fort or Lal Kila of Delhi you find small, small uh, white dome they call kanjuras, jawabs, both sides, one, one uh, of the monument, one side sarai and one side uh, um, a mosque, huge independent buildings for individual inhabitants, like in every fortress complex of Mughal, you would find, uh, uh, you know, uh, separate houses like uh, the so-called Jodhbai ka mahal and Birbal ka mahal and Jahangiri mahal and so on and so forth. These are the characteristics of Akbar's period. The main buildings of Akbar period were Agra Fort, of uh, a fortress complex, a fortress complex at Fatehpur Sikri, and his own tomb where he was buried, very near Agra, is called Sikandra. When you go from Delhi to Agra, you would find on the left side, you would find this particular monument. Interestingly, all three were different from each other. So different from each other that one has to give credit to the genius patron in him. While Agra Fort establishes a style that marked individual buildings for individual purposes. For everyone, they had the individual building. Jahangir would live here. His wife would live here. His another wife would live here. This is not the trend earlier. It set in motion the concept of space anyway and in a way, privacy for the residents or users, it signals. It's a very major development if you look at the social history of the time, if you look at the cultural history of the time. Mughals have started giving value to privacy. We see this generally followed and proved upon in Fatehpur Sikri complex. Another development which was complete separation of religious and profane. Religious part of building will be separate and uh, you know, secular or profane part would be separate in the buildings and allotment of separate space for official building. There would be certain building where official transaction would take place. In Delhi Sultanate period, you don't find this kind of separation. Same building would serve everything. Now this is Divani Am of Agra Fort, red sandstone. Look at the, uh, look at the arches, arches are foliated, like we have foliated arches. Look at the pillar. Unlike Islamic architecture, they started using pillar and bright red uh, sandstone uh, which you see being used here. This is Divani Am. Divani Am is a place where the emperor would meet the people who were not caste, they were not special, not his higher minister, but he also met a lot of other people, but most of the people were very important official. He didn't meet the common man as such, but where he would meet his higher official, but not his ministers and princes, that area is called Divani Am. Uh, you see that Divani Am in uh, Delhi's Red Fort as well. Now this is the fort entrance. Look at it. A simple look at this entrance of the fort will give you that he expected actually it to be a real war fort. He expected a war to happen here. That is why it is a very, very strong, the red sand is torn yet, but it gives you the feeling of strength. Now we come down to Fatehpur Sikri. You know, one thing which Fateh, uh, Agra Fort also had, then we'll come back to it, is that you had buildings inside with Divani Am, Divani Kha, Jahangiri Mahal. For every person, there was a separate kind of a thing. But since I will be talking about that in Fateh Pushikri as well, I thought that let's take the stylistic uh, development. Akbar wanted to create a royal palace, city for himself. Every emperor wanted to. In Delhi, you have more than 12. Every emperor wanted a city for himself. And chose a site so venerated because the Sufi saint Shalim Chiste lived there who had blessed him with much awaited sun. Few years later, he had to abandon this beautiful complex due to paucity of water. There was no water. Water had to be gotten from Agra. It was a huge job from bathing to drinking for everything. So he had to abandon this lovely structure. This is one of the structure which is truly magnificent. And in, in eye of me as a humble student of history, I would say that 
if you have to choose in Agra between all the monuments, you can give a go by to Taj Mahal, but you can't really avoid Fatehpur Sikri. It's stupendous. Made of red sandstone with complete segregation of religious and secular parts. This is the kind of life I'm talking about that the early modern, early medieval, um, late medieval India, which is early modern, because you find privacy is given value. Office is not private and private is not office. Religion is not office and of religion is office is not religion. They're separating all three. And it accommodated almost all regional styles of India and other Islamic land, Turkey, Persia, everything. In the religious section, one finds the mosque, the Mazar of Sheikh Salim Chishti, and the famed Bulan Darwaza. The Darga of Salim Chishti is in pure white marble with a small dome supported by efficient network of serpent touches, which I'll show the picture. Though it is too small compared to other buildings, other buildings are very huge. It was a very small building, but also because it was a, a Mazar of a Sufi saint, and probably the idea was not to make it very lofty. Uh, it's never there was spectacular. More on Jain Gujarati architecture, where the arches were not like this, but arches were used as uh, a snake or a serpent tied around uh, an arch. Very interesting is also that a Sufi saint allowed his bazaar to be built in a palace complex. But equally important is also to know that a a ruler thought of making a mazar. You never find such example anywhere. A mazar of a Sufi scene right in the palace complex. Mind you, right in front of Masjid. Trying to balance them out. This is a very important statement which he's making. This is the Darga of Salim Chishti. You can see the white one is completely white. It has a dome, it's a bulbous dome. It has a balustrade column and then you can see snake, of arches, snake arches and you can also see the jali and a huge courtyard in front and then you can see in a small pond which is uh, actually a vazukhana, vazukhana where you wash hands and kawali takes place in this courtyard. Now, the most, one of the most controversial building of, not today but even then, uh, of Fatehpur Sikri was uh, this Buland Darwaza. It was built to commemorate Akbar's victory over Gujarat in 1568. This is much bigger than the, all the monuments and that is why artistically it doesn't gel. It doesn't gel with the monuments. Other monuments is too huge a monument with, compared to other monuments. The private or secular part of Fatehpur complex is equally fascinating for buildings which individual character is so called, like so called Jodh Bai Ka Mahal. I don't know whether there was any Jodh Bai, but it's known as Jodh Bai Ka Mahal. Birbal Ka Mahal in Rajput style, Miriam's Palace in Persian style, complete with murals, you had wall paintings, and Turkish Sultana Ka Mahal, of course, in Turkish style, and of course, typically West Indian five storied Panch Mahal for enjoying cool breeze. I'll show you the photographs of them. This is Jodh Bai's palace, completely in Rajasthan style, double storied, small house for the main Rani or the main Queen, the structure was small, but it was spectacular nevertheless. This is Birbal's palace. You know, the interesting part of this is not only that it was made in Rajasthan style, but also very, very interesting is that a noble who is not a royal, who is not a prince, who is not a princess was allowed to make a house very much within the, uh, within the palace complex itself. We have no example of that before or after, where a noble was allowed to build a temple. He was not a relative and then he was not a Muslim. He was a Hindu. We don't know how close Birbal was to Akbar. We don't really know. But we didn't know. We don't know about his, uh, you know, humorous uh, self. But we really know about this particular monument and this monument is a giveaway. This is the Panch Mahal. Five stories. You have to go up. And emperor with his family and the queens and women could enjoy the evening breeze. It's nothing other. It's a completely local architecture is fabulous. Look at the guts of the king. I mean, when we look at the Turkish Sultana Palace, when we look at the Marim Palace, when we look at Balban, uh, sorry, uh, Birbal's Palace, when we look at uh, Jodhpai's Palace, look at the guts of a 16th century ruler who was a Muslim who was facing trouble allowing Hindu architecture and Persian and Turkish architecture to come in. This is really good. It's really, really spectacular. Now, this is another building which I've just taken one picture of uh, the inside of the building. Outside, it looks like a very simple double-storied building. Inside is called Divane Khas, where he is to meet his very 
uh, prominent officers. The best part of this building is that it has it is in the it is in a pillar. Pillar has a cupola. Cupola is linked with four bridges. It's a red sandstone where emperor would sit with his officers and discuss the matter so that no one could else could hear. Uh, architecturally, it was a failure. Also because it was never copied anywhere. You don't find anybody copying this as architecture. It was too probably progressive for people to like and they just did away with. Now this complex Fatehpur Sikri was the spirit of tolerance and accommodation of Akbarite times. Imagine including purely Hindu, Jain, Rajasthani, Gujarati person styles in one complex without the fear of Islamic orthodoxy of those times and the courage that Akbar displayed in building them. It's really good. One has to, one has to, th one has to think so highly of him. Now, then there was a Jahangir. Jahangir built some, but many of his buildings are not in India except one, Itmadu Dollar's tomb. Itmadu Dollah was the father-in-law of uh, Jahangir. He was the father of Noor Jahan. But I have given a go-by only because all the features would come in Shah Jahan time. That's why, and for the lack of time, I have included Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan was the grandson of Akbar and the great builder, and a, he had a penchant for marble. His reign is called the reign of marble by art historians. The famous building of his by Delhi Red Fort Jama Majid of Delhi and of course what you all know the Taj Mahal. He gave style more preference over utility and strength. Utility was not important. Style was. Now Red Fort of Delhi. I'll, I, I will not go into the details of that. That is not necessary. But what we have to know is that stylistically built in red sandstone. It was a decorative fort. Not a real one. No one could imagine that in 1739 just 100 years after Delhi became the capital, that there would be an invasion of Tamur Lane right in Delhi, and the millions of people would be killed. No one could imagine. This was an unreal fort. It's a decorative fort. When Shah Jahan decided to shift the capital to Delhi, he planned the whole new city of Shah Jahanabad, including Red Fort. It was then called Kila Mubarak. It was never called Red Fort or Lal Kila. It was always called Kila Mubarak. And the huge mosque that was in front was known as Jama Masjid. Uh, it was also called Jami Masjid, Jama Masjid, where people used to gather. Red Fort was a formal living and official palace complex and less accommodating than Fatehpur Sikri. Its beauty was in constant layout and perfect spaces. This is Red Fort, the main gate we are talking about, from where the Prime Minister hoists the flag. Now the Taj Mahal. One of the last, last topic we are talking about is the Taj Mahal. Look at this building, perfect white. Perfect symmetry, minarets out here, there is a 21 feet platform, then there is a monument, monument is double storied and this monument is on the, on the river, side of the river, Shah Jahan, I will give you the salient points of this, Shah Jahan built his Taj Mahal as a burial place for his favourite wife Mumtaj Mahal and was known as Raza e Munawwara and later historians started calling it Taj Mahal, built in finest marbles from mines of Makrana, it took almost 12 years to construct. It was again built in Chaharbak concept with a gateway, two jabbabs on the either side of the Taj, extensive water work, monument being placed on a 21 feet platform, very bulbous dome and of course the most apt spacing of slender minaret. I, I, to me, to me as an art historian, I would say that the placing of the minaret and the making of the minaret is a spectacular in this building. Uh, Taj Mahal violated many principles of tomb architecture. It was dedicated to a woman not to emperor, it was a queen and not the king who was under the dome. And the monument was in the middle of the Chaharbagh, but pushed to the river front. This is a violation. Taj was definitely a copy of Humayun tomb of Delhi, and uh, only the Taj, only that Taj was all in marble. Taj was special for designs and lines. Lines are very important in Taj. Lines mean contour, but you get the shade. That's why people go to see in the moon. It's for the last time that it perfected the way minaret was being used from the mine tomb to Akbar tomb at Sikandra and in Madhu Dolla. Tomb minaret development I'm talking about. Here in Taj, the minarets were self-standing parts for the monument and in the four corners of the platform, they were slender and they were feast to eyes. The dome here, like Humayun tomb, was based on a drum with added height to the dome and allowed viewer full view of it. This is Jama Masjid in Delhi again, Shah Jahan. 
uh, nothing very spectacular about it, only thing the it is very huge, it is the largest mosque that is the only quality, otherwise it is a very simple thing. On the western side you have a construction, you have uh, uh, minars and three domes, but it can accommodate the largest number of namazis and the prayers, that is the only thing built in red sandstone. But I will also talk about some of the deviations here, Jama Majid occupies the pride, place of pride in Shah Jahanabad. Every Islamic city is to be built, built with a mosque in the center, Jama Majid is not, Shah Jahanabad is not. Built to bolster Shah Jahan's image as the biggest Muslim Sultan in the world, it was certainly the largest mosque in the country. And still, I must say, it was a very traditional mosque in every sense. It was a mosque. Taj Mahal is completely different. Then again you say about Fatehpur Sikri, it was beautiful, lot of imagination had gone. In, in, in Jama Majid there was no imagination, it is a huge mosque, that is all. Unlike his Taj and other buildings, Jama Majid signifies the growing orthodoxy of the Mughals that were to become the worst in the times of Aurangzeb. So, what we are talking about is, uh, uh, you know, in this particular thing we talked about is that how the style which they borrowed from uh, Sultanate period, they actually improved upon them in every manner, whether it is a minaret, whether it is a dome, whether it is a notches, whether it is the height of the monument, whether the material used, you find that Mughal architecture became completely Indian Mughal architectural form and that they did by mixing the local Indian architecture of different time, Jaunpur, Rajasthan, uh, Malwa, Bengal and of course Islamic architecture. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, on that note, we would like to thank Dr. Nimar Kumar for coming to our show and giving such a wonderful lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.